Have you ever been forced into a seemingly impossible situation? Maybe you found yourself surrounded by strange people and unusual circumstances. Or maybe you're just trying to survive, trying to keep everything from falling apart around you. On today's episode of the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, we're going to explore a gritty paradox about a family forged by war and tragically destroyed by it. Since its release 10 years ago, David Ayer's action hit Fury has gained acclaim as the definitive tank war film. But underneath the surface of tank warfare lies a morally ambiguous tale about trying to maintain your humanity amidst the horrors of a World War II battlefield. And regardless of what battles we find ourselves fighting, are we willing to see past the discomfort and do what needs to be done? And are we ready to embrace our calling in life? even if it costs us something. For as a wise prophet once said, here am I, send me. Welcome to the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, where we analyze stories in films that help us make sense of life. We are four friends with backgrounds in storytelling, filmmaking, teaching, and narrative therapy. Join us on our quest towards telling and living our stories more meaningfully. I'm Derek Hatch. My name is Nick Natal. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Joseph Wilson. I'm Jason Lin. All right. So we are in this theme of finding your place, acceptance, belonging, and talking about different stories this month around that theme. And so going from the romance of past lives to the war of fury, I'd love to know, Joe, what made you want to choose this film for this theme? And well, what does this film mean to you? Because we're talking about accepting the the life that you're in. And if you look at it, everybody in the tank pretty much has accepted who they are or what they are mm. in this mm-hmm. in this period of war. But here is this newbie that is walking into this life and can't fully accept it because it's such a hard and death surrounding yeah. type of life. But and in the end, he accepts that brotherhood and accepts that family. And because he accepts that family, they change the tide of the war. Right, because right. without them standing their ground, the Nazis would have overran the Allied forces. And who knows what could happen at that point. Yeah. Um, and I just really do like this. I love war movies. War movies are one of my favorite types, especially World War II movies. Yeah. Well, and you have two different kinds of war movies. You have war movies that, depict real life events, Mm -hmm. right? They're basically, you know, retellings of true stories of what happened. And then there's stories like this where they're true in the sense that these were real circumstances that happened, Mm -hmm. but they're fictional characters that are created in those circumstances, right? Yeah. And either one of those, there's different things that we can learn about war and and honestly about humanity as a whole there. So I'm going to read the letterbox description and then we're going to We're going to go ahead and jump into the conversation. All right, here we go. Fury. War never ends quietly. In the last months of World War II, as the Allies make their final push in the European theater, a battle-hardened U.S. Army sergeant named War Daddy commands a Sherman tank called Fury and its five-man crew on a deadly mission behind enemy lines. Outnumbered and outgunned, War Daddy and his men face overwhelming odds in their heroic attempts to strike at the heart of Nazi Germany. Well, it's interesting that Brad Pitt within five years did two World War II movies. Very different in tone. I mean, mean, Brad Pitt cared about his team in each of those movies. It's just a different way that he cared about them. Which of the two films do you think was a better performance for him? Fury. Why? There's just a, a realism with Fury of his character, but I think an inglorious bastard is kind of like a, a parody of a war yeah. general or something like that. Yeah, he's more nuanced than Fury. Yeah. The yeah. Glorious caricature. Yeah. yeah. But fun caricature. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Brad Pitt's performance is very subtle in Fury because there's a lot of little things he's doing that can kind of go under the radar when you first watch it. Yeah. But you have that opening scene where he stabs a Nazi mm-hmm. and he sets the horse free. Yeah. And that to me, so there's there's two screenwriting tricks that I noticed at the beginning of Fury that David Ayer used. So one is like this trick where the opening scene of the film is a microcosm of what the entire movie is going to be, right? So this is going to be a movie 
where people are going to die, where they're going to kill Nazis, but we're also going to try to hold on to our humanity in the midst of it, right? So he sets the horse free. There's something about Brad Pitt's character as War Daddy that he's not all the way gone. Yeah. There's some amount of compassion and humanity left in him, and he's trying to find that in this desolate place of a battlefield. Even after they came mm -hmm. back from from that scene into the mm -hmm. American campground, and then like he's instructing everybody, and then he immediately goes and hides himself and kind of decompresses himself, and like. Yeah. Just because he didn't want to, he didn't want the others to see that he is struggling. Mm -hmm. He is that supposed to be that strong character type. But even better, it's like it's not that that person is just. And normally in movies, they like that type of character is just shown as oh, they're supposed to be the strong one. Right. But you don't see the other side of them trying to maintain mm -hmm. that strength. Yeah. Like this one, you see that you see he's about to break down. Yeah. But he's like, okay, I got to stay strong for the people in my unit. Yeah, I mean, War Daddy is like the most appropriate name for him, right? Because yeah. it really brings together those two sides of him in one yeah. in one identity there. And so the other screenwriting trick that's used there is something called Save the Cat. You guys ever heard of Save the Cat? Mm -hmm. Superman. From, from you, yeah. From me? Yeah. <laughs> that shows a yes. good guy. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So basically what you do is if you want to have a character that the audience is going to identify with or latch on to have them in the first like couple scenes in the movie or in their opening scene or whenever but in somewhere in the first act you have to show that character doing something good yeah and so you have the save the cat moment like superman saving a cat out of a tree and get for some old lady right mm -hmm. so literally in this movie it's not save the cat it's save the horse mm -hmm. so it's interesting because the moment you see that you see Brad Pitt do that, you instantly feel something. There's a likability there. Even when you get to the scene later where he's going to be with Logan Lerman's character and with Norman, when he has that scene, which I think is one of the best scenes where he has to try to get Norman to shoot the yeah. guy, right? I don't hate Brad Pitt in that moment. Yeah. And it's weird because if, if I didn't have that context, I might. Mm -hmm. But because that saved the cat moment is there and i know that there's something human about him he's not just some vicious killer yeah i i could kind of uh, the the conflict the struggle is all the more real between those characters because i kind of see where he's coming from yeah. and i see where norman's yeah, coming from if you look at the environment the environment is you have you have to kill to survive and if you are not going willing to kill to survive you're going to put everyone at risk right that. So it is, it's Which twisted. Yeah, it's twisted and messed up. But he learned that lesson when the people, when he didn't shoot the, the one of the Nazis and he ended up blowing the tank mm -hmm. in front of them. Right. The children. That happened right before yeah. that. that yeah. yeah, that was the scene beforehand. Yeah, and it's just the fact like you have to or we will die. And yeah. You need to be, you you got to. Mm -hmm. what, what is also innocent, well, I guess I already said it. What's interesting about that, that horse scene is that it's this pure white horse. Yes. It's almost like he's, letting innocence free or like letting the you know the spotless free like the mm, kids yeah and the women and children when they're letting them out of the yeah uh, out of the building but instantly pulls the ss guy out and mm -hmm. kills him so there's like it's this violent brutal snuffing out of of the evil in the beginning and then it's immediately followed by like this very tender scene mm -hmm. so it's really interesting to see those back to back and when he gets in the tank I can't remember. The Punisher. The Punisher. Oh, John, yeah. oh, John mm -hmm. Bernthal's yeah. character? Yeah. Oh, he, he asked him, you get that? You get him? And he's just like, mm -hmm. I knocked him off. It's just, and every other time, he's so, like, violent. But in that one, he was just like, eh, knocked him off. Yeah. He didn't say anything much about it. And you know. Oh, oh, go ahead. I was saying, I just thought of this right now, but the first scene mimics the, la the, the last scene. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Letting something go that is pure because yeah. he's still pure at the end. He had to go through these things, but there's still a purity about machine that just like the, the horse was set free. The German, yeah, the German soldier, which is interesting that a German soldier let him go. What, was it just a soldier? Or I, I, I've heard some comments somewhere that it was an SS, but I didn't go back yeah, and it, look. Was it an SS? All yeah, all SS. All of them were SS. Although they were all SS. Yeah. Oh, that's. But the fact it was, yeah. it was this almost young Norman like character mm -hmm. that's again still had some humanity left, yeah. right? But it yeah. even shows even in your enemies, there's still some type of humanity. 
the, yeah. You can't even, like fully discount yeah. your enemies. That's why this is this is so good. Like this yeah. is a war movie that really, really caught me off guard in the best way possible. Yeah. And the white horse thing, that's interesting because I didn't even think of that while I was watching it. But white horses, I mean, in this movie, clearly the Bible is on David Ayer's mind. And, Ooh. you know, because the image of a white horse in the Bible is twofold because a white horse, if you think of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse is the horse that comes before war. Yeah. So the white horse is uh, conquest. Is that the... Yeah, that is a white horse. Yeah, it, it, or a pale it's horse. Yeah, the pale horse is the last one. It's right, death, right? The, but yeah, the white horse comes before the war, before the bloodshed, because it's that desire for conquest. Mm. But then also, when you get to the end of Revelation, a white horse, you know, with Christ riding on it, is ultimately what saves the day. Yeah. So there's a white horse of conquest that's you know evil, and then there's also a white horse that liberates. And it's interesting because I think. With Shia LaBeouf's character, who's just called Bible, that's his yeah. nickname. Boyd. Boyd's his actual name. Boyd's his actual name? Okay. <laughs> I didn't even... Say his <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah. That, but there's some interesting things going on there, because again, like all five of these main characters are trying to hold on to their humanity, and the Bible is the way that he does, right? And I didn't know this. We were looking this up. Tori and I were looking this up while we were watching it. But this is the movie that actually brought Shia LaBeouf to Christ. No way. Yes. So he became a Christian by being this character and learning, like reading these, by, and he just kind of realized like, oh, this is actually what I believe. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's wild. So. That's crazy. But, but yeah. So, I mean, you get that scene where like he's praying with dying soldiers, like lots of just moments where it shows their humanity. Yeah. Yeah, let's kind of get into like talking more about the dichotomy between this family. So there's War Daddy, there's Bible, there's Norman, who yeah. will end up being known as Machine, and then who, the other ones. Gordo. Yeah. There's Gordo. Gordo. I like the truth. What are their names, names though? What are their nicknames? It's it's it Gordo, Kunas, Bible, Machine, and <laughs> War Daddy. Is John who's John Bernthal? Kunas. Oh, okay, just checking. Who's the Punisher? John Bernthal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean he he was right. <laughs> All right, good job, Jason. I'm quoting. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great not cussing memory. if you're quoting. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, yeah, you so only understand the fist and the boot. Yeah. <laughs> Don't call yeah. me an animal. Yeah, because that's another thing too. Like just uh -huh. just the family dynamic of of all of them. You're right. You have the person who's into the faith and who is trying to keep the family together through faith. Mm -hmm. You have the the youngest, which is Norman, which is a machine. Well, and he's a replacement, right? Yeah. Like, if you think of, like, the metaphor of yeah. the tank, right, of Fury, because that is the family. It's a family of Fury. Yeah. And the they lose a person. You know, somebody dies at the beginning of the film, and they have to get a replacement. Yeah, the replacement and, has to pick up the face. Of right. The so, so they're not just— Always picking up a new face. Oh, gross. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, a, that's a stretch, but a good stretch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that one, though. Yeah, so Norman is the, he's the replacement coming into this family. And it's interesting because there is a scene where Norman has to replace part of the tank, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's ironic because David Ayer is kind of laying it on, like, pretty obvious, you know, that Norman is, you know, the replacement. But he's also going to be the only survivor of this family yeah. by the end. But I'd love to know, like, when you think about these five, like, what are some things that stand out to you about them as characters, about their dynamic as a family, the metaphor of them, you know, through the tank and fury and what that holds together for them? The crossroads scene is the number one thing that stood out to me because I try to put myself in who would I be in that scene because John Bernthal's character is the toughest guy and then just crumbles when it really mattered. So so describe the scene. The, um, it's when Machine is on the lookout for the Nazis and they're coming. The tank is broken down in the middle of the crossroad. And so Machine comes back and he says that these Nazis are coming. We have to, like, it's a whole battalion. Yeah. So they, can't, they can't win. So naturally, everyone's like, all right, we got to go. We save ourselves. We try to figure out how to survive this moment. And Brad Pitt says no. And as soon as he says no... It's just like really striking. We're going to hold this fort. But for what reason? That's what I'm thinking. And so I think in that moment, Bible, Charlotte Bus character is like, wait a minute. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And John Bernthal is crying. 
and Machine is observing and he's the first one to step up. Yeah. But when you talk about humanity and what's human mm -hmm. in this movie is standing on that principle, standing on something far greater than just like what we see now, but more of the eternal things. And that's yeah. what they do and they keep their humanity. Yeah. And Brad Pitt says, this is this is not what I want to do, but this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that there's... moment, that moment is why I would want to own this film yeah. is to have that moment with me, like to remind me, this is what you stand on. Mm. And it's not about self-preservation. Mm -hmm. It's about moments just like that. Yeah. And so that, that dynamic was cool. And Charlotte Buff was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What are you doing? Yeah, literally yelled at yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's flipping yeah. out. I like. Well, and again, as you said, Joe, this changes the tide of the war, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about how them taking a stand on Fury and not just abandoning it, yeah. right? About actually stick, sticking with it, what Nick was just saying there. How does that change things? So at this point of the war, again, I don't know if this is fully history, but in yeah. the movie, in the context of the movie, if this SS battalion, which the SS are like the, I guess the extreme type of Nazis, yeah, yeah, yeah. if they cross this line, then it's really going to hinder the allied forces to be able to liberate the camps pretty much, right. liberate the people that are, that are captured by the, the Nazis. So they are the only tank that is left. Like yeah. one of the only American tanks that are left that can actually put up a fight. Mm -hmm. But like Nick said, their tank breaks down. Mm -hmm. So it's either a choice of pretty much freeing people that you may never, like fighting for someone that you may never even meet or see mm -hmm. or anything like that, or save yourself and try to fight another day, even if you can fight another day. Yeah. Because I did the research on it and yeah. this movie takes place five months before the war actually ended. Mm. So they're so close. They were so close because they started the war together. Yeah. And if they were so close to ending the war together, but they technically ended. Well, it almost brings Brad Pitt. Um, it brings war daddy's line full circle because he says earlier in the movie, a whole lot of people got to die first. Mm hmm. Ideals are peaceful. History is violent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of the lines that he says, I think he realizes in that moment that he's got to be, he's going to be one of those people. Yeah. He's going to be one of those people that's going to meet his end before this war can end. Yeah. I think all of them have just like, just accepted that in that moment where it's like, okay, if we're going to stay here at war, daddy, we are going to die. Yeah. It's like, are we okay with that? Like, yeah. Like, Brad, uh, not Brad Pitt's. I'm going to say Punisher's. Punisher's character. What's his name again? What is his character? Conass. Cone? Cone? What is it? Coon? Yeah, Coon. Coonass. Like raccoon. <laughs> Wait, Nick, what was it? I forgot my phone's dead. <laughs> <laughs> but just all of them were, like, he was crying and it's like, yeah, like, I, like what just Nick was thinking, like, who would I have been in that moment? I probably would have been crying, to be honest. Like, yeah. All right. I'm, Dude, those on, are the Jason. two that just freak out crying. Yeah. Like, we're going to die. Yeah. And then, and then a shadow buff is like, <laughs> whoa, I got what, I got to figure out why. Well, he, well, isn't this the part where he reads the here am I, the verse from oh. Isaiah? That's when they're it's all in the, in the tank. tank. Yeah. It's in yeah, the yeah, tank. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is before they, this is when they're all outside the tank. Trying when they're to outside the tank. After that. When, but then when they're waiting, when they're waiting for them to come, right? Yeah. That's, that's when the he acceptance. That's the, that's the real acceptance of and it And then all. Brad Pitt reveals that he knows scripture. scripture. Yeah. 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 Well, I want to talk about that moment for a bit because that was a moment that really stood out mm -hmm. to me because there's several places where scripture is sprinkled throughout the movie. Yeah. But that moment of the here am I, send me. Yeah. So that's, you know, referring to Isaiah and Isaiah 6 when he gets his calling, right, to be a prophet. He has that vision. Yeah. And being a prophet is not an easy calling to have. It's going to come with trials and tribulations. And so Isaiah gets this calling. And that's where the famous line, you know, where God says, is there anyone, mm -hmm. you know, and Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Yeah. And so that's, they embrace that calling in their own lives because they recognize what the role of fury is in this war. And the role of fury is to die. Yeah. I think the movie does a really good job showing that realization one by one that mm -hmm. they all have, yeah. that that is what the role of Fury is. Like the tank is not going to make it. This family is not going to make it out. 
And they're all dealing with it in different ways, but that's the moment where they finally accept it. Yeah. I was thinking about one of the scenes. I was talking to Jason about this at work. You know, we see each other. Yeah. And when Kunas is like the first one to die and Mm -hmm. Bible breaks down and like goes over to his body. I was thinking, I was like, I think that's because Bible knows that he didn't accept Christ Mm -hmm. or he's one of the few, like one of the ones that probably weren't going to accept Jesus. So it's like, even Mm -hmm. though like this is my brother and I love this man. Chance is gone. His chance is gone. And yeah. I, yeah. And I may not, I may never even see him again. Yeah. So it was like, it's those type of things. Like even as like a Christian, it's like, dang, it's like, I wouldn't want to ever like not express the, like express like the love of Christ or anything like that to somebody. Yeah. Because life is just like it's, that. And it's quick. I've, ha- I've had it happen. It's awful. Mm. Yeah. So we, we got to talk and, about this, uh, house scene. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. the house scene is actually my favorite scene. Mm-hmm. So the house scene is my favorite scene and it's the one that I've been just sitting on for weeks ever since I watched it. It's yeah. probably going to be the thing that most carries with me from the movie Yeah, because it was an incredibly well made emotional scene in the sense that I felt a lot of joy mm-hmm. and I felt a lot of discomfort. Yeah. Feeling all of that at once was pretty surreal. So this scene, Nick, can you walk us through it? Like just kind of how the sequence unfolds? I think Brad Pitt and Machine are walking through this house in the city that they're taking over Mm -hmm. and they find two women. Mm -hmm. A mother and a daughter. Yeah, and they- Cousins. cousins. Or cousins, Cousins. sorry, yeah. They match the ages though. So the the older woman is right around Brad Pitt's age and the Mm -hmm. younger woman's right around- Norman's age. Norman's age. And they kind of engage in what it, they're, they're tr- it looks like they're trying to engage in some form of like they're normal, playing house. normal life. Yeah. Family. Yeah. They're playing house. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, family. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, not sure, eh, no. uh, I'm not sure it's family. It's just, just like some kind of normality that's not war. Like mm-hmm. just having coffee at a table with mm-hmm. a woman and reading the newspaper. Yeah. Playing that's piano. That's what he did. Like, that's yeah. literally what he did. Yeah, just, playing piano. Yeah. Having a that, shave. Yeah. And he yeah. made fun. Someone else made fun of the other guy for, like, when did you start shaving? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the newer uh, lieutenant or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then they, you know, he has Norman and the, the young girl, like, go into the room, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Brad Pitt is trying to take control of, like, this house. Like, yeah. the father. Like, he's the, the daddy of Tank, but in this... He's the daddy of Fury, but in this moment, he wants to be like the daddy of the house. So he's right, like, you yeah. guys go do this. You yeah. make me this. Mm-hmm. And there's just this sense of like, again, a lot of layeredness to this character. Because yeah. he can be a little abrasive at times. But you also see that he is so desperate to try to reclaim some sense of humanity yeah. that they're living out this house sequence. And then the moment the other three guys show up. Mm-hmm. It's the, destroyed. The, 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 and, and the way that Brad Pitt acts that out. The yeah. way you see the discomfort in his body, yeah. on his face. I think this is the moment when I really realize he is giving an incredible performance. I would even say the discomfort was even in when Brad Pitt was taking control. Because it's like, yeah, yeah it's it's this is a nice little moment, but this is a forced Nice, very forced. He, he's making it like this. It's like, yeah, let's like you said, you go make me coffee and go make breakfast for everybody. Mm-hmm. You two go in the room. It's like, yeah, it worked out and it was nice, mm-hmm. but it's still, I'm taking control over this situation. Yeah. But there's a moment, not a moment, but it, the women almost want it too. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. 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 Everyone in the house has a chance to breathe yeah. before yeah. the crew comes in. Yeah. And then yeah. back to the reality of war. Well, it's almost like it's, you're in a different movie at that period. Yeah. And then when the three come back in, like you realize reminded. what movie you're still in. Yeah. There's it's, go ahead, Jason. I was saying I think the most relaxing time comes after the music, after Norman starts to play mm-hmm. on the piano and then the 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 young woman Sits Emma just joins yeah. in and starts singing. You're good with that. You're so seriously, good. Seriously, bro. I never would have. <laughs> Jason studied. And it's and, it, and it's Grady. His name's Grady. Who's Grady? The John Gordo? Berthal. Oh. Punisher. The great. That's Grady, his name. Berthal, Punisher, who? You're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. The, it's, like know, the, it's like one, the last shit I stopped. I know what the, you want. One of the coolest things in this film is so small for me. It's him playing the piano. Yeah. And it's really beautiful. Yeah. It's really intricate and complex and then 
John Bernthal comes in and smashes the mm-hmm. piano. Yep, yep. And really that scene is the the tension between the the well played piano and just the crushing of yeah. it at one mm-hmm. time at the table. Yeah. yeah. And they're dancing around that. Yeah. Yeah. And that that was just a really great way of illustrating or developing that character is yeah. the piano sound. I, well, I hated when he did that. It was, like, awesome. it was just like, yeah. it was like awesome. it's, it was good, but like, yeah, it was so grating and just, cause you wanted to be in that moment. Stuff. You wanted to have the happiness for those mm-hmm. characters in yeah. that moment, but then they come in and they're obnoxious at the table mm-hmm. and they're just, you know, and even frustrated. They're, like, they're at war. They're and at war. And they know it. But it's like, why can't you just try to sit down and enjoy this moment? Why are you ruining this? But it's also just like, a, why are you, the for in their perspectives, why are you pretending that we are yep. not in the situation that why, we're in? Why, why did you leave us out of a chance for normalcy might be another. Yeah, I thought they were too. jealous. They were mad. Bible I, I definitely was. Yeah. I think it's both. Because yeah. I took it like what you said, where he's like, why are you... Why are you trying to act like this isn't real? Yeah, because like when they then, brought up the horse story. That's when they bring up the horse story of how they don't steal all the horse. They yeah. just wanted to ruin it. Yeah. Oh, they, you're you're going to do this? Well, watch what we do right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's when the, the scene when they go back into the town, they come, they leave the house, and then, you know, things start getting blown up. The house is going to get blown up with the— Yeah, that— with, that line always hits me. I think I cry yeah. every time at this. Yeah. This is and he's war. holding yeah. Norman, and he's like, because I think that's the explosion there, is he's mm-hmm. like, he doesn't say it, but he's almost communicating, like, you want to play house? Like, you want to do this? Like, this is what's really happening. Yeah. He was like, well, you going to raise her from the dead? Yeah. You Christ? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh and he was even willing to go get him. I'll go get him. Like, when Norman was running off to, like, go see the, the blown-up building. Uh-huh. He was like, I'll go get him. But the but when when they come together and and talk in the in the in that one little house with yeah. the, with all the dead people and he's like I think I think you're a really good guy yeah and e- even and there's another time where it's like it was after they they fought the the tiger and all the other tanks yeah. got killed the scene destroyed sick, by the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's like <laughs> they, so so what our number didn't come up just big pair of dice up there just rolling them and it just wasn't yeah. you know we just rolled three snake eyes or whatever mm. I was like jeez yeah. and, and and one thing I don't know well, to go back to the house scene so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just realizing now all of their names because we're talking about belonging and acceptance all of their names represent how they tried to adapt to the war to belong mm. war daddy mm. he's yeah. at the top mm-hmm. they, they call him top um, yeah he's adapted to this war by commanding Acting as a father to everybody, and that's his identity that he's made. Like he's the yeah. one who calls the shots. He yeah. puts himself on the front line at the most exposed. Yeah, he dives right in. He keeps order. He tells the others what to do. Yeah, he he, he controls. Yeah, war daddy, literally war father. Mm-hmm. That's what he's done. Kunas, it it. I looked it up just now. Some think that it comes from the French word for fool, mm. which is kunas. Or whatever it's it mean it means Cajun, and so literally by becoming a fool, He's just a fool. just just diving right in the war, just being belligerent and and right nasty now, yeah. and and just cracking crude jokes. That's that's how he's done. He's become the the animal, even though he does not like being called that. Yeah, mm-hmm. there, he, there is humanity in him. Right, Gordo, like humor deflection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Norman sees the the really pretty woman, the walking by in the. In the bike, and he's just he just ruins it. He's like, she'll she'll sleep with you over anything. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> and Grady's like, it's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gordon's like, it's not true. Oh, sorry, it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, it's true. You do, you can do a smokes too. And then and then Bible has tried has kept his humanity. He's adapted to this war by through the scriptures, through Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how he tried, that's how, the role that he's taken on to adapt to the horrors of everything. Yeah. This is how they all adapt to it. Yeah. Deflecting with humor, becoming a fool, Mm -hmm. controlling being a father, looking to God and Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And and then there's the machine. Mm. He just fully does or takes on whatever's right in front of him. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think he has, of the five of them, he has almost the most tragic nickname yeah yeah because i think norman at the start he had the most apprehension to wanting to be in this war like he didn't want to kill anybody 
But then by the end, he is mowing down people, well, no to, problem. In order to adapt for him, you would have to just shut off. Yeah. And yeah. I think like that's. He had too much of it, mm-hmm. too much humanity or too much emotion and life. And left he's in like him. a machine where he has to. to shut off. Yeah. yeah, he has mm-hmm. to shut it off. But, but I think there's hope for him as well because even though he's done that and he's lost his family, when he sees the, the SS, the child, mm-hmm. you know, soldier that comes to him and he lets him go, yeah. I think it's that reflection that there's still humanity left yeah. within everyone, but they just have to find it. Yeah. So. Side, side little tangent. In the tiger scene with the tank, they actually mm-hmm. pulled out an old, the only uh, World War II yes. German, uh, German tiger. For that Did scene. they really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's insane. It's dope. So da- David that's that Ayer, real tank. that's the real World War II tank. David Ayer was animate in making this movie that he wanted authentic tanks. Yeah. Were they really shooting? No, they weren't really shooting. So that's CGI. But, but them this rolling was, around out there is not really done. Yeah. yeah. The anti tank rounds bouncing off the tanks was was pretty sick. Yeah, that was yeah. scary. I was like, oh my gosh, Dude. three tanks and they yeah. just taking them out. Suicide Squad. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Go go from Fury to Suicide Squad. Seriously, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He's got another good movie, End of Watch, with Gordo and I think really? Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, um, really? At, yeah, it's decent and it's super violent. Too, you said End of Watch. End of Watch. It's a cop movie, but he was oh, like, Oh, I know exactly which one you're talking about. He's got a couple about. good yeah. movies, and then yeah. he, Suicide Squad, like David Ayer's on Suicide Squad, and then he came out with that garbage. I think that's more studio stuff than yeah. actually him. Yeah, I like this one. End of watch. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. we should. If he made Fury, we get, he gets the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. yeah, like when you think about your life, do you have a like a here am I send me kind of moment? I'm living it. Yeah. <laughs> How so? I'm living it with the job that I'm in now. Pretty much, God has definitely told me that I need to stay in the position that I'm in right now, mm-hmm. even though things are hard. Even though. Dealing with the kid's trauma is hard. Like yeah. You take that work with you. Mm. But it is definitely a, I'm, I'm here, Lord, and I'm, I'm standing firm even through these tough seasons. Well, you know, it's when I, because we've all worked in the same place before. It's interesting when you think about that because I feel like that's kind of like our own theory in a lot of ways. You work with, you work they with. are not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be the last one to die. I'm about to say, Joe, which one of us is going to be left? Oh, man. Not what I want to do. This is what we're going to (laughs) do. Oh, it's so good. Oh, so technically, Derek, you died first. Yeah, technically, <laughs> I was the first to go. And Nick, and Nick, how it's it's you. It's and just you two are take. left. One, of, one What's of up, you is top? Norman, but yeah, it is kind of like that <laughs> because Fury is a family forged by war. Yeah, and when you're working with kids in the inner city, it's a family forged by working with traumatic, yeah, circumstances all around you. It is yeah. war. You know, everybody's got their own trauma, yeah. not just the kids you work with, not just the families, but each of us mm-hmm. has our own crap that we're working through as well in the yeah. process. So finding that here am I send me moment is that I know I'm in the right place. Yeah. Even if it's just for a season, right? Because hopefully you're not being called to to die to give your life, right? But, sure. uh, yeah, but you're being called in another <laughs> sense, but you're being called in another sense to die to something within. Yeah. Part of that calling of that here am I send me is yeah. maybe it's not a physical death, but there's a spiritual death. There's something that has to, again, going back to the theme of past lives, there's something that you have to let go of in order to move forward. Yeah. And and the thing with the prophet's call and also the call back to the fury is there's a futility in it, whether perceived or reality it's to do something that's probably not going to work or it's going to stop immediately. Isaiah, no one's going to listen. Um, yeah. <laughs> or or return or turn in the fury. They're trying to stop people who, who will not quit. Yeah. Like Brad Pitt saying, or saying, we're going to go to the next town and the next town and the next town until you people quit. Yeah. Yeah. And they're getting in this tank and they might get five before they're just completely blown up. But they're well, they're answering a call, and they're accepting where they've been placed. I was even yeah. thinking their, tu- their duty. Yeah, even like sacrificing yourself and not even knowing if your sacrifice changed yeah. anything. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Yeah, pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we've all done on that yeah. line right there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Any final thoughts on Fury? 
Super good. Yeah. It was, uh, nine out of ten. Maybe my, my favorite war movie. Wow. Really? That so Glorious too. Bastards don't even count. That's like a separate. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. It really is. That's an alternate it universe. Was, it really that's, is. That's like, this is like World War II Returns. Yes. World War II yes. Returns. <laughs> yeah. Batman yeah. Returns for all still, you folks Still looking there. for the uh, steel book <laughs> for this one, Nick? No, I found, oh, this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah not yet. As the, like a steel covering for it? Just the, when I buy it on DVD, it's going to be dope. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, this was good. I, I thought this was a solid movie. Definitely in my list of favorite war films now. Yeah. Definitely is a lot of good rewatch ability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot I'll, I'll go back to in this. So. Great, oh, wait. One last, one last one last. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So at the end scene where you're seeing the tank in the middle of the road, uh -huh. or in the middle of the, um, yeah, the middle of the road and the camera pans up, it literally looks like a pebble or rock in a stream. So, oh, yes. So mm -hmm. the street looks like a stream. And they were they blocked that path of water going through to protect mm -hmm. the other side. And that's I think all that was the, really cool. That's all, all the dead Nazis, Nazis yeah. and all around. It's like, jeez. Yeah. yeah. It's good stuff. That yeah, yeah, this movie was really good. I well that final shot. Mm -hmm. That final shot where the the camera lifts Pans up, up over the tank, yeah. And you see everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But but just that's how much of a difference one family sticking together can make. Mm -hmm. They so can literally just turn hold, the tides. Yes. Literally hold back a, a whole river mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. And if you're interested in learning more about the craft of storytelling, like t I talked about the Save the Cat example earlier, if you want to learn more storytelling tips like that, then consider subscribing to our email list where you'll get a free bonus episode on five tips to improve your storytelling. I share these five tips with all my clients and I'm giving you an exclusive look at them. So all you have to do is sign up at the link in the show notes here in the description and you will be well on your way towards becoming a more effective storyteller and join us next week as we bring together these themes of love and war into a final film on acceptance and until next time take care thank you for listening to the live a meaningful story podcast produced by all things narrative if you'd like to learn more about our coaching workshops events please check out allthingsnarrative.com you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at All Things Narrative. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tune in next time as we continue exploring the stories we love and the stories we live. Take care.